I was delivering Domino's pizza um, in 2017 and and in 2019, 20, it was a little less than 24 months later, I, I had a $3 million portfolio and had financial freedom. Um, and since then, I've only needed to work three hours a week. Rent in, in a suitable house is only giving you a couple hundred bucks worth of cash flow. You're adding a couple thousand dollars of that. So if somebody really wants to be financially independent or even take over their salary, they literally only need two or three co-living houses. The number one demand um, for a rental unit is the single person lease. Can we maybe define for the audience a classical definition of co-living? A living unit, whether it's a house or an apartment, shared by multiple independent adults, they can create kind of a non-traditional household. It's not short-term rental, it's not an Airbnb house, um, it's not an extended stay hotel, it's not a rooming house. They're living there um, in part because they want to live with others that they respect and appreciate, and at the same time, they're not sharing a lease with those others. I'm Garrett Wong, and this is the Investing to Win podcast. How do you define success and what does winning look like for you? Before this episode starts, I have a small favor to ask from you. 88% of the people that watch or listen to this channel did not subscribe. My goal is 50%. So if you've ever liked any of the videos or podcasts we've posted, if you like this channel, can you do me a quick favor and hit the subscribe button? It helps this channel more than you know, and the bigger the channel gets, as you've seen, the bigger the guests get. Thank you and enjoy this episode. Grant Shipman, welcome to my podcast studio. It's it's really an honor to be here, Garrett. Thank you. So I actually reached out because you have a very compelling story and I love, uh, I love learning new things about real estate, but that's more of a teaser. Why don't we uh, start <laughs> with the normal podcast intro? Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about your background? Yeah, I, um, so my background, it was, I was kind of that jack of all trades, right? Um, master of none, which was frustrating until I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? And, and I learned the rest of the quote, which was jack of all trades, master of none, but often much better than a master of one. And I just, I just loved, I just love that because what I learned was, hey, if I am good at uh, kind of good at a number of things, then I can bring people together and they can enjoy their specialty and I can enjoy my specialty, which is coordinating people. I, I love communities. Um, so uh, as far as um, how things kind of ended up that that I, I accidentally um, had, you know, 20 years of, of co-living experience um, that would end up playing a huge role in real estate. I mean, it just, it, it's not a surprise, but it's nothing I saw happening at the time. Um, it's just something that I really enjoyed. And so my background kind of finding co-living by accident, and then 17 years later, finding that, wow, this is really an accelerant to what I wanted to do with real estate and, and playing a role in my life. Okay. Um, well, back up for a little bit. I mean, where, where are you currently, where are you currently uh, located? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so uh, I live in Estes Park, which is about an hour away from Denver up in the mountains. If you go to Rocky Mountain National Park, you go through Estes Park, the city. Uh, nice. It's a little town of 5,000. Yeah. my um, uh, I grew up in Iowa and kind of everybody dreams of retiring to Estes Park, which is my parents did that. And so we wanted to have babies, my wife and I. And so um, four years ago, we moved to Estes Park. Um, we just started, uh, I'm at my, my uh, winter house in El Paso because Estes Park is beautiful, but the winter just keeps hanging on. So we, uh, we, last year we got this, this um, house in El Paso where we've got some really good friends down here and we're, we're enjoying the heck out of it. Uh, so, so that's where I'm at. And, um, and yeah, as far as you were saying with bio, I just get, I'm like, oh, wow, what's, what's exciting. Oh, wait. Um, is is for for me what I do is um, I I'd I'd wanted to be a father and I had a number of businesses and they weren't they weren't um, they were paying my bills but there's no way they could pay the bills of a guy who I wanted to have kids 
a family and the schedule and the finances to enjoy them. And, um, and so I found myself um, kind of accidentally in co-living um, real estate investing and, um, and it's great. I, I uh, um, like my house in Estes, I've got my parents there, family, all of that stuff. And I, I work about three hours a week and my staff does all of the stuff. And, um, and it's, you know, like, you know, Garrett, the magic of real estate, you, you provide homes and value to people. That's, um, really, uh, huge in comparison, the amount of work that you do, as long as it's smart work. You know, I was smiling when you said winter keeps hanging on because uh, I don't know if you did your research on me, but I'm up here in Manitoba, Canada, right yeah, in the Howling I, Prairies. I need and, to shut up. <laughs> yeah, well, although there is something uh, that we keep hearing, you know, our weather people keep saying, oh, there's a Colorado low that's coming through, <laughs> so, uh, which usually means tons and tons of snow followed by freezing cold temperatures. So I don't yeah. know if that's from you guys, but uh, <laughs> thank yeah, you. You're, you're welcome. Yeah, I, I need to eat my words because, right, like we got nothing on, <laughs> on you guys. <laughs> no, it's all, it's all good. All good. No. Um, yeah. In all seriousness, why don't you kind of go through, I, I, I like to know that and say that sort of our, our backgrounds kind of make we who are make us who we are, why don't you tell us a little bit about your educational background and how that's kind of shaped your direction and where you're going today? Yeah. So, um, just to, to, to start where, where, um, I'm going, like where I am in, in 2017, I started a co-living investment and property management company. Um, and, uh, and it just made sense at the time. Um, but where that all came from was in, uh, in 2020, I ended up moving into a first, um, a shared living environment. So co-living, it's been called lots of things, right? Intentional living, um, co-housing, community living. Um, but I, I ended up moving into one of those just because I liked people. And, and it was cool to see the different ways that these communities, I mean, these communities have, list, have existed for hundreds of years. And um, and they are not the way most people experience like, oh, I had roommates once or I had um, I had uh, um, uh, I lived in a uh, rent by the room situation. Right. This is something nobody wants to have that unless they can uh, if they can afford otherwise. But I, I moved into this. And I just I realized, wow, like. It, I always want to live with others as long as the benefits of that like outweigh the cons, right? There's a, there's a healthy system in place where I can feel stable, but free to be myself. So I moved into that. Um, uh, my, my only official, uh, as far as, um, uh, college training is a four-year BA in psychology. Uh, did this help me at all? I don't think so. And to do again, I would have done business. This was at a time um, where they didn't realize the brain was plastic. So it was all about diagnose and, and drug. And it just didn't appeal to me. Um, but I did get a college degree. That was what's important to my parents. I went on to be a college pastor. I really liked that. That was all community driven. If I look back, the thread of my life has all been understanding community dynamics. How can it be where pe people want to be together, but how to make that enjoyable? Um, so I was a college pastor. Then after that, um, I was in Austin and, uh, and I discovered, uh, the, the yoga and specifically the acro yoga community, which is a form of partner yoga and acrobatics. And you can't do it with some, with, with, by yourself. That's just how it is. So a group of a hundred plus would meet Friday, Wednesday, all throughout the week classes. Um, and that's, this was kind of like the healthy nightlife, the healthy life. People are doing acrobatics that, you know, the year before, they were sitting overweight at a desk job, right? And now they still have that desk job, but they're in the best shape of their life. But it's not because they're working out. It's because they're just excited to, you know, balance somebody on their hands. So that was all community driven. Um, and uh, and so as far as my background goes and how things happened, you're 100% right. Like it it made who I am. But at the same time, it, 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 it just seems like I was following a track that I didn't you know I was even following, right? I was just making decisions in the moment that I thought was the best at the time. You know, you say that your degree was, uh, didn't really help you and you regret it. Um, 
<laughs> my listeners know that I have a, a science degree. I was in a PhD. I, I dropped out six months before I was going to graduate. I now have a master's in molecular biology. People ask me that all the time. Do you have any regrets? Because mm. I used to say the same thing that you just said. I wish I had gone to business school. Mm. And don't get me wrong. I wish I still had because I, I, I struggle sometimes in the running of my businesses. But something that you said resonated with me because relationships, right? Mm -hmm. I would challenge you to say that what you learned in your degree was relationships and how to manage those relationships and now getting onto communities. Um, so can we maybe define for the audience um, maybe a classical definition of co-living and then we can kind of explore the different types? Yeah, I, um, so and, and this is really good because the co-living term, it's a, it's a, it's a young industry in a sense. Um, in another sense, it's a very old industry. It's, um, it's actually been uh, a multi-billion dollar industry in the world since around 2003. And, um, but as far as being young and still um, using terms, so before it's been known as co-housing, um, intentional communities, all of these things, where co-living rose above all the other terms. So to give this a definition, um, is that when a unit, a living unit, whether it's a house or an apartment, um, anything like that, which would normally have uh, a platonic family in it or a group of friends that just signed a lease together, uh, that this is uh, shared by multiple independent adults. Um, and so it'd be people who would otherwise be living alone or renting a room now are sharing a living unit and they create, don't think like a co-op or a commune, that's that's a different idea, but they create kind of a non-traditional household. Um, so as far as co-living goes, it's not short-term rental, it's not an Airbnb house, um, it's not an extended stay hotel, it's not a rooming house. Um, this is something where people, they're living there um, in part because they want to live with others that they respect and appreciate. And at the same time, they're not sharing a lease with those others, nor are those others, um, you know, their family are married to. Although, I mean, that of course can happen. Sometimes we have couples move in, but this is a non-traditional, not like a, a blood related family. Okay. So you said it's not a rooming house, but I mean, at least by my definition, people who are renting a room might share a bathroom, might share a kitchen. That sounds like a rooming house, right. and yet you're saying it's it's intentionally not. Can you explain? Yeah, and this is there's some um, some uh, some nuance there as far as talking about it. When you show up to a place, you can really understand it. And um, and I'll if you don't mind, I'll um, kind of back up because That's as far as means. Yeah, real estate investing, um, and, and to tell you, Garrett, I I struggled with communicating this message because uh, most people, I, I think most is correct, most people hear it and they think rooming house, or I've heard about that, it's rent by the room. And what that automatically means, particularly when you're thinking about return on investment, is that it's not worth it. We have high turnover, high tenant conflict, high property damage. So the revenues might be higher each month, but the um, the bottom line, the profit is not higher and the stress is not worth it. Um, so people think about college housing, senior housing, all of these things. So um, so there's there's that confusion. So I think I'm gonna try out and you can you can uh, tell me if this, this uh, I'm communicating it better is if we take a single family house, um, usually if this is traditionally rented out long-term, um, it's on a six, 12 month or longer lease and, um, and it's on one lease. So that one house is on one lease. Um, that house could be rented out as a short term rental also. Um, now these, these rentals are less than 30 days a piece, but it's still one house, that same house with one lease at a time. The leases are just shorter in duration. Um, this also would fall into, say, uh, midterm rental, maybe three to six months. Um, still one lease, one house. But if we take that same house uh, and we put a lease on each bedroom, um, 
So in a sense, it's a rent by the room, which is a similar rental strategy. Uh, then it becomes um, a rent by the room. That person is responsible only for their lease, but that house, um, same house has now say five leases on it or six or seven leases. Um, our smallest um, house has four bedrooms. So that would have four leases on it. Um, now to, to that makes it a rooming house or a rent by the room. What I would say is the nuance with a co-living house is that this is a place where people want to stay a long time. So, so our average renter is there for over two years. Some have been there for five plus years where, and this is, this is where the big difference is uh, as, as far as saying what is co-living compared to what is rent by the room or a rooming house. Rent by the room, rooming house, boarding houses, these play an incredibly important role in society because there are people that need temporary places to stay. They cannot afford other places typically. Um, and it provides important, very important housing. Um, but to confuse that with a household that is really just like, you know, another single family house or single family apartment. Um, however, it's people who are living there because they truly want to. Now, maybe they value saving money um, without a doubt, but they're living there like so for when i moved into a co-living house um it was eight people down in austin and just, this is an example of of i wanted to live with people it just happened that you know one gal's mom was sick and so she was gone a lot another guy bruce his band was really taking off so he was gone a lot and i found myself in the house alone a bunch of the time and i thought well this is not serving my purposes i still had the same low cost um, in Austin near downtown, $400 a month, right? That's incredible, right? Fixed rate utilities, yay. But a co-living house, the, the intention would be, hey, um, I'm going to move in. I don't need best friends. I don't need brothers or sisters. I don't need people to support me. Um, I don't want to live with a bunch of my college roommates or a 55-year and up community. Um, I just want to live in a place that has res like people I respect and appreciate that we share the same roof. And um, and if you would walk into it, you would say, oh, man, this is this is a nice place. I like this. People are always shocked when they come in, if they see if they hear eight people live in this house. Right. But eight people live in houses all the time. They're just usually related. And if that household is run well, then that house is, is clean. It smells nice. The lawn looks good. All of those things um, hit me. I mean, I'm sure I left some things out or con was confusing. That was my best try. How was it? <laughs> I am writing down questions. You can see that. So, um, okay, let me let me start here. So, co living, and I looked this up, and you see things like rooming houses, sobriety right. houses, uh, even some, I guess, extreme halfway houses. Yeah. But what you're talking about is people who want to don't want to live alone, who want to live with like minded people. Mm -hmm. um, how how are you matching those? Is it the property manager's job? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have so many questions. <laughs> so yeah, that that is, I mean, I'm telling you, I'm glad you asked that question because it is spot on what I get asked the most. And it actually, uh, there was a, um, uh, this is, it's kind of like, like eHarmony in the sense of people think, hey, if I live with the right people, I will be successful. Um, however, a lot of people have lived with roommates, um, or a brother or a, a cousin or something that they get along with great. Actually, they might be incredibly similar with, and they have a terrible shared living experience. So, um, so how do we do it? And this is a, you, as far as I know, um, I've, I've worked hard to understand, uh, the co-living world um, in the U.S. larger than that, and um, and there was a company named Ollie, and um, Ollie had this software. Um, let me let me look here, so I'm given exact information. Um, so Ollie was started in 2012. They had 15 million dollars um, funding, total funding. I mean, it was a big deal, and they had this specific software that matched the right people. Um, however, in 2020, when 
households like mine that practiced a different way of, or sorry, co-living houses that I ran that practiced a different way of doing it, we thrived during the pandemic. Ali suffered terribly, so much so they were going to close, but they got acquired by another company named Star City. Star City valued this idea of pairing up the right people with each other, right? Let's put all the teachers together or let's put the extroverts together or let's whatever. Um, and Starsty um, also then, let's see, they they were acquired by Common the next year. This, this, um, this doesn't work. And I actually, I felt like when I, you know, I'm this, this little company, right? Like Starsty was uh, a 50, their total funding was $50.3 million and they were started in 2016, right? So massive money, massive staff, massive research. Um, and what I was seeing is they were not talking about a thing that I have experienced is the most important in co-living. And so what I, I said is, I go, I don't think these companies are going to exist like in time. I, I, I don't see how they can unless they are talking about this X factor. And I'll share that in a moment. <clears throat> but they're, they're, I mean, I'm sorry, they are using this X factor, but they don't talk about it on their websites or I would call them up and ask about things. Um, and um, and so, so um, um, Garrett, I'm kind of circling around your question of, of how do you match these people? And, um, and are what we have found to work literally 100% of the time is instead of looking at finding the right people, and pairing those people up with the right people. What we do is we have a 40 point household system. We look at what is a healthy household, meaning a household you wanna live in is one that's stable enough that you feel safe, you feel comfortable, right? The, the things aren't changing all the time. At the same time, it's not, there's plenty of things that are not rigid, like a boarding house. Nobody wants to live in an overly structured place. Um, like you walk in it and there's rules, you know, posted on the oven, there's rules posted on the, the TV, there's all these rules and you're just a cog in the machine, right? And you're fine with that if you're only there, you know, a month to six months. Um, but this X factor is, um, and we created our whole property management system around it. We call it household led property management. We create a healthy household. We communicate that in, um, in our application process. The people who are often will self select out of it, if that's not what they're looking for. And, um, and we believe that as long as people are reasonable and responsible, they're gonna thrive in this household. We don't need those people to be a certain personality, a certain um, generation, something like that. So we create a healthy household and um, like any healthy household, you know, some somebody might slip in that's in an unhealthy place. And that healthy household has a way to remove that person. There's a, there's a conflict resolution system. They can remove that person, really simple. Um, you know, just like, any health house, right? If some, some uncle or aunt moves in and they get a little bit, you know, irresponsible for a while, they get talked to a couple of times and then they get asked to move out. And, you know, and the best news we ever have is there's uh, uh, when somebody gets, we, I mean, essentially they get kicked out, right? They, they get kicked out and they're all pissed off. But then a couple of years later, they come back and they're, they're paying money back. They're making amends and they ask, Hey, will you let me back in? And that house lets them back in. And they're one of the best members. And they said that was the most important thing that happened in my life was me getting kicked out. So, so to say is a healthy household, you don't need to, um, you don't need to screen personalities or interests and a healthy household not only protects against problems, but it makes everything wonderful. Okay. I think I'm starting to get it. Why don't we do this? Walk us through what I call, because we're both property managers, property management life cycle. So I'm a single person. Um, I'm tired of fighting with my roommates, but mm. I don't want to live alone. Maybe I want to share some costs. I hear about this thing called co-living. Uh, what, what do I do next? What do I do? Yeah. So what would happen is you would search on the internet. Most people do this. And you would find um, one of our listings. We don't list any place in particular special, you know, Facebook, Craigslist, you know, a software 
our software syndicates to you know 21 different free sites, right? Um, and so you would search and and you would see a, a thing that says, hey, a, a room and a shared bathroom. Some of our rooms have have in suite bathrooms with a shared bathroom. You say, okay, it's seven hundred dollars. Where you know here it's in in this area it's going to be twice that you know for any kind of lease and and you see oh you don't have to have a minimum credit score um nor um you know have three times the income of your rent which um which uh that's just because as a landlord you don't have to have as many safeties in place and we can talk about that later on the landlord side but you would say oh okay so then you would click on that link it would take you to the website the website has a little whiteboard explainer video which is great that shows you like oh this is how it works and this is the kind of people and it's fixed rate utilities so i don't have to you know yell at somebody if they keep leaving the windows open while the air is on right like you're like oh this is this could be really cool and so you schedule a tour you um you go to the house, one of the people in the house, we call them house members. They would meet you, um, walk you around the house, answer any questions. You would see a house that you'd be like, whoa, there's, there's eight people that live here. It seems so quiet. And that's what we want them to see. Uh, so if you would come in, you'd be like, oh, this is so quiet. And does that kind of house appeal to you, right? Because that might not appeal to everybody. And then you would see a chore board um, and the, the, um, the person giving you a tour would say, Hey, each of us do 20 to maybe 60 minutes of chores each week. And that's what keeps this place as clean as you see it. You're like, Oh, wow. Um, because when you have multiple responsible adults, it is really easy to keep a place in the lawn. Fantastic. Right. Or shoveling the driveway in the winter. If that's, that's the area of the house. So you'd see that. And then the, the person would let the um, the person would giving the tour would say thank you Garrett and um, and you know just be in touch with the property manager if you want to apply do you need that application link again nope you already got it great um, and so they would fill out an application it's twenty seven dollars in our area it's normally fifty dollars for an application so twenty seven dollars seems really great you fill that out uh, property management does a, a criminal background eviction background check on you confirms your identity, social security, all of that stuff. And um, the person who gave you the tour gives the property manager a thumbs up or a thumbs down, right? This, hey, this person, they, they're they great. Um, and if that happens, then you get a lease offer. Um, you sign that lease offer online, everything is paperless. Um, and then you, you, know, you set up your payments um, online, uh, free ACH payments, credit card payments, optional. You pay a security deposit, $700. And then you're scheduled, you're moving. And you move in, you get a 20-minute member orientation. Your name's been added to the chore board. Um, answering any of your questions. You have some storage shelves in the garage, so you don't have to keep everything in your room, right? There's a, a grill on the deck. And then, um, and then really, you're just living your life, um, doing your thing. You can reach out to the property manager in our form of property management, our household-led property management, which we think is extremely important, it is it is a necessity for co-living to work. The property manager is known as the household supporter, meaning the household runs itself, but your household supporter is available for support. So um, you might have a question about rent, or maybe you want to rent a parking spot in the garage, um, and uh, and so you might ask. I ask the household supporter, they get right back to you. But really, you just live and enjoy your life. You get to know people. Some houses, we don't we don't do any kind of community events. We create a healthy household. And if people want to have a movie night or, you know, a house might go to the, um, uh, you know, downtown to, to walk Main Street or go out to eat. But those things in a healthy household happen organically. Um, and then um, say, say you want to, um, your, your lease is a month to month renewing lease. Cause you're not sure about this house, right? That's kind of nice. It's month to month renewing. Um, however, if you move out within 90 days, um, you know, you lose half of your security deposits. We don't charge move in, move out fees. Um, but it's intended to be, you know, at least a three month, um, thing, but you're just like, this is fantastic. And you decide you want to sign a three-year lease because this is wonderful or a one-year lease, or you just want to keep it month to month. However, this goes on, you enjoy it. And, um, and then, I mean, yeah, it's, I would say, 
Um, if you're one of about 50% of the members, you are there until, until you can't be there anymore. For instance, say your job takes you out of the area or, um, or say you decide you want to get uh, married or, or something like that. And your, your, your future spouse doesn't want to live in a co-living house. Right. So, um, but, but we really do people, people that it fits, they love it and they can't find it anywhere else. Um, and then there's going to be other people that, you know, they decide they want to move on. We've had plenty of people return, you know, after maybe a relationship didn't work out or a job transferred them back. Um, does that, does that answer your question as far as life cycle? No, it does for sure. Great. Um, a couple of follow-up questions. So you mentioned chores. Yeah. Uh, we are dealing with human beings here. So if uh, Johnny comes in and loves everything and gets the thumbs up and he doesn't take out the garbage two weeks in a row, is it the household supporter? Like, are we talking mm. about he gets grounded? <laughs> <laughs> what, what happens here? Yeah. Yeah. Let's... Um... Yeah, and this is so important where it's the household-led property management. Um, this is really big. We, t we teach it to anybody because it's so, uh, so key. Um, if the household, a good, a household that you want to stay in um, is a household that you can help protect and, and stay the way you want to. So, um, so, for instance, if Johnny is not doing his chore, then and somebody reaches out to the property manager and says, Johnny's not doing his chore, right? Because we love to complain to people. That's just how we are as humans. It's fine. The property manager just says, oh, that's great. Like actually, you know, remember the household covenant, which is part of your lease, says, um, you know, to, to follow the five on five process. And, um, and that, that covering what that is, 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 a, is a whole nother thing because it's so, it's so cool, but it's this very simple um thing where somebody would say to Johnny, Hey, can we do a five on five? It means a very, it's a 10 minute or less conversation. And, and they share their thought. Johnny shares their thought back. And if that solves it, great. Um, and then hopefully everything is great because what builds trust is conflict. Um, and I'm going to say something um, to, uh, in regard to other co-living options out there. There are co-living options that are very afraid of conflict um, out there. So for instance, they're gonna encourage you to turn your living room, if, you're, if you want them to be your co-living um, manager, turn your living room into a bedroom. Why is that? Well, they might say it makes you more money, but they will also add, we, if we have a living room, it'll increase tenant interaction, which will increase tenant conflict. Um, and, and what we understand is that tenant conflict is extremely important because if you don't have conflict, you don't have a relationship, but if you have conflict and a way to solve that conflict, you just built trust. Um, so I'll give a, a, a quick story in one of our first houses. Um, there was one gal, she was home. She was so happy. She was home. She had the day off. She loved it. She loved it. She loved it. And she heard a dog bark in one of the other rooms. She's like, oh, but then that made the dog bark in a, one of the rooms in the basement and they just barked back and forth and it was driving her crazy. And she had a dog and it wouldn't bark and she was so pissed. <laughs> and so she contacted the property manager. She's like, hey, hey, can you tell these people have their dog stop barking? And the property manager says, hey, just follow the 515 process. So um, yeah, and she told me this story later. Her name's Kim. So Kim says, um, <laughs> this was this is back in 2017 when I was the property manager. Kim told me later that she just, she would like, her heart like hated these women, you know, these other two gals in the house, their own names dogs. And then she sent them a text and one was Amy and Amy replied right back. Oh, I'm so sorry. She came back um, and, and with a, a little barking collar for her dog and it solved it right away. And, and Kim just felt super loved. Like, oh, wow, she was worried about me. And she saw that in the, the other Gil, the other girl, Jill came back and brought her dog to work with her until she could figure out how to make that better. And so conflict built this, these gals relationships so good. It, if it never happened, that would be a problem. So, so just to say the, what you're hitting on as far as, you know, all of us are going to slack on our chores sometimes and we need somebody to say, Hey, you know, that might be a, a wife, that might be a, uh, um, a roommate. Um, but conflict is, is a way for us to, to build 
to build real trust and appreciation as long as there's a way to handle that conflict. And if it's if there's a way to handle it and somebody doesn't respond well, then it's then it's a way to take that further and set boundaries. So, yeah. OK, no, that makes sense. Getting back to the leases, Grant, um, is it one lease or separate <clears throat> leases? Separate leases. OK, so do you maybe this is jurisdictional and city by city because it looks like a rooming house. Right. Um, I was going to say smells like a rooming house, but I mean, that doesn't apply if you've got your <laughs> if, five by five rule, but that's really it, bad. I'm it sorry. Does, it looks, joke, like, but... looks like one, smells like one, talks like one. <laughs> yeah. No, but in all, in all seriousness, I mean, at least here in Manitoba, we would run into rooming house violations and licensing mm. and bylaws and things like that. And actually in, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, you're grandfathered for rooming houses, but you aren't technically allowed to create another one. Mm. Do you see any conflict there, depending on where you might have this co-living house? Oh, a thousand percent. Be classified as a rooming house. So, um, so yeah. So when we we uh, in 2019 we released a a, a complete um, co-living course, and something it starts off with, which is every real estate investor's thing, as far as. What they do is they need to develop their criteria. And we talk about property TAF, which is type, your area, and how to find it and how to finance it, T-A-F-F. And so area is, is a key part of that is knowing what the local regulations are. Um, so this lots of times has to do with zoning. So is it light residential, medium residential, um, commercial, um, heavy residential? Um, some have uh, like say the state of New York or the state of Iowa, they have a law that says, hey, the fair housing agreement completely outlaws like the idea of, of, uh, of limiting people living together based on their family status, right? Where other states and um, and I'm sorry, I'm not this, I'm not familiar with with any can Canadian example, but other states, um, have very strict laws. Um, the the ones that developed in zoning laws for cities in the the um, 70s was a no more than three unrelated adults. Or a town near us says you oh, wow. plus two. Okay. So these are really key. And um, and actually, a town that I was in, they changed these rules three times in two years, <laughs> which is really annoying. But to say when you're picking this out. Um, it's key to contact whatever lo um, local or, or regional state or uh, government official and say, hey, um, of course, can this, can I have, do I need a rental license? What laws are there for occupancy? Um, actually, the state of Colorado is looking at um, statewide not allowing smaller municipality cities to limit based on family status. Um, so these laws are, are changing in the States. I'm not sure about other countries. I know that we have a lot of university students up here and um, we will tell them that's fine. We can have university students, but you're all going to be on one lease. Mm. We're going to make, you can, you know, designate a spokesperson, whatever it is. So it kind of forces everybody to obey the rules of the household and make sure that, again, we'll pick on Johnny, but if Johnny hasn't <laughs> paid his rent, well, all the other four roommates are in danger of being evicted. Do you ever put everybody on the same lease or in your model, it's always different leases? It's always different leases. And I think that this, I mean, it's important, you know, a, a, health, a healthy household, people are responsible for themselves. Although there's obviously, it's a level of interdependence, but particularly when you're separate adults, signing the same lease is a problem. And I think it's actually a, um, it, it's a little bit of sometimes us real estate investors, buy and hold property managers, we sometimes can make mistakes. Like, so for instance, saying that that dogs have to be under a certain weight if you want to have your dog there. Now, this can be great, but a lot of the other side says, hey, listen, you know, the big fat heavy dogs are the ones that don't cause problems. It's the little ones that dig holes in doors and carpet. But but in relation to this, um, and this is where I, I like the states that have landed on um, not discriminating against people based on their family status, is uh, um, one of the Supreme Court judges of Iowa argued very thoroughly that according to no more than three unrelated adults, four clerics or monks or nuns couldn't live together, but 20 cousins with their motorcycles 
can live together in a single family house. Um, and, uh, and because they're related by blood. And so the idea is, is not so much, um, is this family related or not, or are they on the same lease or not? The idea is that there needs to be health, safety, um, and, you know, whether it's sound, noise, um, these people need to act reasonably if they have neighbors that are close and they live and want to enjoy a city. And so the, those laws are there. And I think that states are starting to realize, hey, um, the safety that we thought we had by these other rules, um, that's not getting us those things. And we need to beef up our rules on, on um, you know, just people acting reasonably, you know. Okay. Okay. Um, are these houses, I mean, I, I think it's obvious to me, but are they all being rented as furnished? Um, we, we started, uh, so all the common areas are, so the, the common areas are okay. inside, outside, except for private bedrooms. Um, we started out furnishing private bedrooms and some people decide to do that. Um, we, we have found that most people want to furnish their own private bedroom. Um, if somebody wants to move in and um, and they want to pay an outside service, we connect them to that you know can furnish their their bedroom um, before they show up. That's almost never used. Um, I think um, Garrett, if I could if I could uh, um, touch on a couple things as far as uh, like zooming out with with co living, like a, an industry and the options there. Sure, if that'd be great. Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, and then as far as from investors, because um, renters, this is the the thing right, right now. The number one demand. Um, this is also in Canada. Um, the number one demand in Canada and the U.S. and similar countries is the single person lease. It's a number one rental demand. Um, any, any, um, I actually got in, in, uh, it was really funny cause I was this like young punk investor, but I would get in, in arguments on say bigger pockets or otherwise. Um, I mean, I mean, helpful debates. That's really what it was, but with very sure. experienced and they were going off, say the census bureau, right? We're defined household based off of, um, not who's living under the same household, but a financial household. Um, and so, um, however, if you look at any of actual research, um, Harvard, um, banks do it, who is living together, the number one demand um, for a rental unit is the single person lease, um, which co-living speaks to. Um, and, uh, um, uh, but, but in regard to, um, in regard to co-living, renters already want this. Um, as long as they show up and the house is nice and the price is great, which it is, and the property manager says that, that's great. What we need is investors to recognize this co-living option that lots of times they either never knew about or they just think it's a rent by the room or it's college housing or it's senior housing or it's sober living. Um, so to say is, um, is I, I had uh, so many people are, might be familiar with um, – um, with Oren Claff. He wrote the book, uh, pitch. Um, it's like, it's considered some required reading for marketers, but he, I was on a hot seat. Um, let's see, two Februarys ago in Vail at a conference. And he looked over our website, living Smith website. He looked at everything and he goes, Grant, here's the problem. He goes, you're explaining this. Like you created this because you don't know how to explain it otherwise. Cause people have never heard of it that you talk to. He goes, but just two months ago, um, for a few hundred thousand dollars, I created a pitch deck um, for for a large company. It's a it's a several million dollar company. He goes he goes in the U.S. alone. This is a hundred co living. It's a hundreds of million dollar industry, if not low billions. He goes the the world is billions and billions. This is a massive industry. Since two thousand three, <clears throat> more people have been living alone than at any than than any other group of people. So he goes, this is massive, but the issue is these are the large um, hedge funds, big money, um, institutional investors and companies have owned this space. Uh, he said, what you and others are starting to do is showing the individual investor how they can get into the space, which brings it out of the big cities like LA, New York, 
and <clears throat> and throughout the middle America, which is really great. So so just to say, I want to I want to cover from investors because that's my deals. I want to encourage investors to um, to learn about co living. There's lots of options out there to find co living that really. Um, works. I would encourage a co-living company that is not afraid of conflict. So one large co-living company, they have a 24-7 hotline where tenants can call to solve their conflicts. This means they don't know how to have the house solve their own conflict, right? Um, I mean, can you imagine two renters that you've never met of in your life calling you up at 2 a.m. and you're trying to solve their problem, right? Like, <laughs> and so, so just to say though, um, what happens is a typical house, so a house that would rent out in my area for 2,700, in co-living, I can get $5,600 for it. So, um, so this is significant. It is the same house. It is only one roof. It is only one kitchen sink I'm maintaining. However, my rental strategy, um, just way up the revenue. If you're in multifamily and you change to a co-living property management rental strategy, you have just upped your cap rate, which is significant without spending any additional money. Um, some, some other, and these are the reasons why I went from, I mean, I was, I was delivering Domino's pizza um, in 2017 and, and in 2019, 20, it was a little less than 24 months later, I, I had a $3 million portfolio and had financial freedom. Um, and since then, I've only needed to work three hours a week. I like to work 25 hours a week because it's fun doing this kind of stuff. I really enjoy it and spreading the, the message. Um, however, as, in, as investors, realizing that um, just like with anything, if you're Airbnb business, um, if you're an investor and or property manager, if it's taking you too much time, it's because you don't have the right management systems in place. Um, they're out there. You can find them. And, and that's the same with long-term rentals. It's the same with short-term rentals. But co-living is so new. People are trying to manage it like they manage other types of, of uh, rental strategies. And it's its own unique rental strategy. Um, so that is really key. So for example, for our system, a lot of people, um, I want to start encouraging people to share specifics. Our system, we can have one full-time property manager, so a forty to sixty thousand dollar position, um, and a uh, um, so forty hours a week, and then a twenty hour a week um, admin. We use uh, foreign VAs, so they're around let me see four four fifty an hour, um, right? So so fairly cheap, about um, eighty a week. Um, that they can support at least a hundred and forty leases. Um, so. So really understanding um, what the property management load is with the proper systems, we're always learning and growing. So is our system good? Have we have we do we have 100 percent confidence in it? Yes. Are we always wanting to learn? I, I just took um, there's a there's a co-living week long course out by another company and I just took it because I'm I want to I mean, right now, those in the co-living space are not competitors. We are teaming together to try to help people understand even what co-living is. Um, so just to say, it's a massive space. However, you know, um, I, I mentioned that that one company, Ali, with its $15 million, right? It, it didn't survive the pandemic. Star City bought it. It didn't survive the pandemic. Um, it was bought by Common. Common um, is a $113 million startup in 2015. Less than 50% of their properties are now co-living properties. Um, they have a lot of issues um, but these aren't these aren't bad things. It's just they're finding their property management style. We would have those same issues if we didn't learn from. Um, and I guess this is something I didn't mention is is I didn't I didn't make up this stuff myself. What I did was I lived in a um, a number of of, of co living places. One was started in 1978 by um, by the people who went on uh, a few years later to start up Whole Foods in Austin. And they, mm. they were in the intentional kind of um, that what we would say, like hippie ish, like in a good way um, stream of things. But they had decades of this built up tradition of how to live together in really beneficial ways. And they did it so well that I just took a lot of their stuff. I stood on their shoulders 
and took a lot of their systems and just transitioned it to a property management um, rental strategy that had nice houses or, or really like, like um, um, what do you call it? like middle class, nice houses. And, um, and so, so to say the, the, the industry out there is huge. Tons of money is being pumped into it. A lot of people are losing, um, but there are winners coming up just like any young industry. And then to share with you um, the, the last thing um, as far as this, the big thing, my, my, my best like kind of warrior call for investors out there, whether large or small, um, if you are multifamily, if you have 100, 300, 500 plus units, right? This is worth you checking into. Not all your properties are good co-living properties. A huge thing is that the property has to fit the usage, right? Um, but if it does fit the usage, right? The, the, the parking, the square footage, the bathroom to bedroom ratio, all of these things, if it fits that, not to mention the zoning and local regulations, if it fits that, the, fin the finances are phenomenal. And I'll give you an example. I don't get a house unless my cash on cash return is higher than 50%. Um, that's just period. That's how it happens. And that's, I mean, unless you're awesome with fix and flips or other magic things, um, I haven't met people who are able to pull that off. Um, and, um, and that's the reason why I was able to get financial independence so quick with none of my personal capital. Um, and in the um, kind of the last thing to wrap it, wrap it up with encouraging investors out there um, is to say to really get um, to really get uh, training or some kind of a uh, an understanding of property management that fits um, co-living because investing um, you're just going to use use all the di different, you know, you know, tried and true investment strategies of buying whatever property you're interested in. Um, but with co-living, we recommend single family housing. It has all the purchase and asset benefits of single family housing, all of the rental benefits of multifamily housing. When I have a person move out because it's month to month lease, I don't care because I'm still getting six checks coming in on that property. Um, right. I also the property stays super nice because there's seven responsible adults in there. If somebody's a problem, those other six are going to take care of it. Also, every month, my property manager walks that property and they love it when they see her. She comes in, she refills their cleaning supplies and leaves some candies. And they're like, yeah, she has though. Um, she's seeing that property every time. So these properties stay in great shape. Um, so I want to encourage you that this is possible it's very much a system. None of my renters know me anymore. This is, we have staff doing it. They follow the systems. We use normal property management software. It is awesome, but um, don't jump into it like it's typical long-term Airbnb rentals. I'll, my best guess for you is like these multi-million dollar startup companies, just in a smaller scale, you're just going to be pissed and frustrated in about a year to two years, and you're going to switch back to something and say co-living didn't work. Okay, so let's take a top-down view, as you said. Um, single housing is growing, and it's going to become the greatest need. Uh, cash flow-wise, I mean, your $2,700 rent in, in a suitable house is only giving you a couple hundred bucks worth of cash flow. You're adding a couple thousand dollars of that. So if somebody really wants to be financially independent or even take over their salary, they literally only need two or three co-living houses to make it happen. Right. However, and there is the underscore, you have to know what you're doing. You can't use traditional property management techniques because you have to manage the household occupants the proper way to success and your best. Obviously, you want to put a plug in for your own company because you teach this stuff, but at least just recognize that you can't just rent it out like a long-term Airbnb. Um, I wanted to add a further point because my investor mind is kind of churning here. You're talking single family home. Obviously, everybody out there listening knows what a Burr is. Mm. I mean, this is a perfect opportunity to whether you're going in with your own money and burring it and getting that out, or you're using a capital investor or JV partner and doing it that way, and then tons of cash flow with only one asset, one roof, one heating. Oh my gosh. Uh, I mean, it, it seems too good to be true, to tell you the truth. <laughs> right. Well, and, and, and Garrett, you, you nailed it. Um, 
And so I must have done, done such a, I, sometimes I confuse people the daylights, right? Like, sometimes the people, my staff explain it better because I'm so excited. I get like lost, right? So I'm, I'm glad that it, it's so much of a game through. You're just really good at. Yeah, I'll just put a quarter in the machine <laughs> and let just let you go, right? <laughs> but to say is, is um, you nailed that. And the, the benefits of, of like lower insurance, it, it is the reason why I would say um, the too good to be true is because we get paid based off the value we provide. And right now, the number one demand value is the single um, person lease. And we've just taken a house that would normally only provide a little bit of value or, or whatever a normal house provides. And we've just multiplied that value and people get. So this is the, the cool thing is, is somebody, an investor gets way more for way less, right? And a, a renter, it's the same thing. They get a whole nice house for the price of a room. So um, the way I like to put it is that in co-living, if um, anybody is going to win, everybody has to win big. Um, like it's it's just a cool thing. Well, this is the Investing to Win podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was bad. That, that was, was bad. great. No, okay, all seriousness. I'm going to give you a couple minutes because um, I know nothing about this. Why don't you kind of go through what you guys teach in your course? Of course, I'm going to be putting uh, your contact details into the show notes, but give us uh, an investor an overview of what they can expect. Yeah, I. Um, so what we we've we've been trying to um, make our products to really fit where people are and what they want. Um, so um, the we have a a toolkit because people are sick of courses. This is what we've heard. They've paid for courses. The courses did not get them what they thought it would get them. Um, and so um, we have toolkit, meaning templates, SOPs, um, things like leases, master leases, LLC documentation, um, syndication documents, um, marketing templates, uh, email templates for property management, text templates, everything that we use, we just made that um made that available. And one toolkit is finding and financing a co-living property. So it's it's not just its financial criteria. Um, you can really, I mean, we're not teaching anything different than others out there um, in regard to that. There's really good stuff, right? If we were teaching something different from than Bigger Pockets or Gary Keller, then we'd be teaching the wrong thing because they're teaching great stuff, right? Um, but the uh, functional criteria, right? What about square footage and bedrooms and to bathrooms and parking and all of this stuff? Um, functional criteria is really important. The second toolkit is is all of the property management, the household-led property management. Um, we consider it the gold standard in co-living. Um, and, and that is um, its own separate toolkit. Um, and um, and that's, it's, it's really phenomenal. And it's actually something that is makes things much easier. So if somebody um, somebody is managing it themselves, or like when we started out, this this um, a, a house would take like a seven person house would take like ten hours a week. Now it's taking one hour a week. So Grant, um, what about people who want to maybe not necessarily do it themselves or just download a toolkit? Do you have any other um, elevated resources available? Uh, yes, and this is something that we're really proud of. It's called the the Living Smith Strong Start Program, and um, this is a three month program where somebody who they want to know everything that we do and not just know it, but help us implement it, and then they can. It's theirs forever. They're they're not attached to us. Um, the software is theirs. All that stuff. Um, is is uh, the the Strong Start program? It's three months long. A property manager of ours um, helps you learn and set up all your property management software, your task management software, your files, your leases, everything. You get all the templates. You get all our um, SOPs, everything. And then they even come out and spend three days with you at your property to oh, help wow. you set it up and to make sure everything is good. And then. The next um, two months, then there's there's follow up calls as you come into different questions and as people are moving in. So this is something where we say that this is a strong start, and then you can replicate that 
as much as you want, but we are really excited about that. Um, so people wanting that level of support, we call it done with you. We would love to provide that. Okay. All right. Excellent. Something, uh, I, I, uh, we are, we are doing our best because the, the courses can be higher priced and, and different things. You know, people are, are wrestling with credit and stuff out there as we are coming out with a book, um, which we already have one out, um, called welcome home, but that's more renter focused. Um, but we are coming out with a book co-living investment, the gold standard and co-living and property management. But, um, um, but that, that book is going to be a normal price book and it really is ever, we're not holding back. I mean, we, we, unfortunately were, it was not like our 22 page leases in there and, you know, pages and pages of SOPs and things, but I mean, everything is in there. We're not holding back. So if you are a book person, um, keep a the lookout, um, for that. And, and again, um, whatever that, that me or, or my staff can do, um, to help, um, it's, it's one of those situations where like co-living is kind of too good to be true. So we, it's easy for us to, to, um, to help others. Cause we're just as excited about it, if not more than them. Right. And so, so thank you again so much, Garrett. Okay. No, that's great. Uh, it's great that you're having a book. Uh, what a great resource. So we have that, but something, um, if you get on our website, we, we just relaunched and you can get a, um, a, a free 30 minute call with any of my staff. That's really neato. But, um, but Garrett, I was thinking about like, if I'm, I'm one of your listeners, cause back in 2016, 2017, I was just scouring any, anybody who would, you know, was doing this cause I wanted to learn, right. I was, I was new. Um, and so something I've made. So if you, if you uh, go to our website, livingsmithpro.com forward slash secret gift um, uh, made this for, for your listeners, they can schedule with me for 45 minutes. And it is any question they have, I will give them my absolute best on answering that because everybody's in a different place. If somebody's an extremely experienced investor, they need to, they need other questions answered. If somebody's extremely experienced, say they come from the intentional community, but they need to understand real estate and business, that's a, a different thing. We go from bookkeeping to what do you put your property in an LLC or not, um, to lending, um, uh, creative financing sub two. Um, I would say the, um, the final thing that we teach, which I'm not seen taught out there. And this is more for like, um, the newer hustler is, Anybody is familiar with house hacking? Garrett, did you do um, a lot of people, investors, you know, at some point in the beginning, they did some kind of house hack. Did you do anything like that? Of course. Right? Uh, yeah. Um, I've done it. I, I recommend it. I've got a 19 year old and a 21 year old at home. And I said, I'm going to kick your butts if you don't house hack when you move out. Do not just rent. No, no, no joke. joke. So um, well, I'm an advocate of it. Absolutely. So this is um, when my course came out in 2019, I called it beyond house hacking and confused the daylights out of everybody. But, but, um, but this is um, now we call it now we call this strategy house hooking house hacking 2.0 because what is house hacking you get a house with owner occupant financing right so one 3.5 maybe five percent down it's amazing at least that's right in the the um the states and then you um so you get owner occupant preferred rates for or terms for the loan then you rent out the rooms um probably for the first 12 months, 12 to 14 months, and then you can turn it into whatever kind of rental you want. Now, uh, what's the cool thing about co-living is it makes that first year um, really way more enjoyable because that's the way the house is supposed to be. You're living in one room um, and the house is making great returns. Then when you move out, congratulations, the house just made more returns and you can continue to duplicate that. If you, um, if you go even further with it, um, what we do is we bring teams together. One person might bring the money. Another person might qualify for the loan. And another person who will be on the loan is going to commit to live in the house for 12 to 14 months. Um, and so now you can don't have to wait 12, 14 months. You can, can really power that up. And the great one is because you know how to property manage um, co-living, um, that first year, it goes smoothly. I, I lived in these houses for my first two years. And I loved it. I, I mean, it was, it was fantastic. Nobody knew that I actually owned the house. Um, it worked out well. And so you don't have the pressures of anything. So, so to say, um, 
um, for as far as what we what we teach, those are those are the the um, the main things. But really, wherever somebody's at, whatever questions they have, um, you know, use that forty five minutes with me in the in the in the intake. Send the questions that you have. I'll try to do research. I mean, my um, my hope is whatever we're doing that's good is other people replicate it and they get those results. And and also that I get to learn. I When I did this co-living training, this this week-long one, I gained something really super cool. I didn't know it before. And so I added it to mine and I ended up getting a free house and walking away with $30,000 on top of it. It was bomb. Well, I, like I said, there's just, my, my mind's kind of churning away here. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's cap it at that. We're going to be putting all that information. I do appreciate you uh, with the offer for my listeners. I'm sure many people are going to take advantage of it. And I prepped you with this question. So I, I hope you did some soul searching. This is the Investing to Win podcast. How do you define success and what does winning look like for you? Define winning to me is, is that is that a person knows what winning is, what they really want. That for for me, I let go of what I thought I want or what my parents wanted for me or what the personal growth, you know, coaches want, you know, to find success that I really found what I wanted and how I wanted to get that. Um, and so so that's how I would define success is, is I mean, what your question actually points to is, is define it for yourself. Otherwise the only way to be fulfilled is to know what fulfills you. Um, and so success or winning, winning for me, um, what it, it looked like was I wanted a family and I wanted meaningful work, work that meant a difference for me. And that gave me the finances and the schedule to really enjoy, uh, my family or, and friends. And, um, and I just, I'm, I, uh, I, I've, I'm, I'm about to turn 43 and so far the 40 decades is, I mean, each decade has been my favorite, but it keeps getting better. Right. So, so, um, it, it's Garrett, what, what you're doing here and how you do it, like it's, it's really, um, it's really efforts like yours that have helped me to, you know, to, to figure out my own success and to, to experience it more and more. So thank you for doing that. Thank you so much for sharing the insight, for giving me a window into something I never even knew existed. That's why this podcast is here uh, and your wealth of knowledge. And um, I will be reaching out offline to find out more about this opportunity. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on and uh, we will definitely be in touch. Thanks, Garrett. That's great.